magic systems and the next magic system and the next magic system. So that's what we're going to talk about. Why don't we do a uh, real quick introduction, starting down there with Larry, and uh, we'll get this ball rolling. Uh, my name is Larry Cree. I, I do, I'm best known for the Monster Hunter series and a bunch of urban fantasy and ultra history stuff, but I also do some epic fantasy. And uh, uh, I like tropes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jim Butcher. I'm the author of the Dresden Files, the Codex Alera, and the Cinder Spires. I'll give you a Spider-Man book for Marvel, but there's there's no more of them, so good luck finding one. Um, we have some in uh, booth 300. No, they sold those. They sold those out. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. They were right under my feet. But uh, yeah, there were like 20 left in the country, and, and Alexi got them for Bard's Tower, but they sold out. Um, but uh, uh, and uh, I think tropes are widely misunderstood, and they make me a little bit grumpy. <laughs> uh, I'm Brian McCullen. I write the Powder Mage books, Flintlock Epic Fantasy, uh, and I have a love-hate relationship with tropes. Uh, I'm Matthew J. Kirby. Um, mostly uh, middle grade YA, uh, most recently of an Assassin's Creed YA series with Ubisoft and Scholastic. Um, I, I uh, also have a love-hate relationship with tropes. Um, <laughs> I, I like to use them, but um, sparingly. Cool. I'm Brian Lee Durfee. I'm the author of The Forgetting Moon, published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. And I brought the book today specifically to start off the um, trope panel because uh, I, 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 I uh, address tropes in the very introduction to my book. And if you'll just bear with me for about a minute, I'm going to read a paragraph out of the book. It's in the acknowledgment page. But it starts us off perfectly into the trope. One of the tropes, really perfectly. But let me start it off with this. So this is from my own personal life, okay? As someone who was adopted and knows nothing of this biological heritage, I've always been drawn to the heroic quest tales of orphans and bastards. Luke Skywalker was my favorite as a kid. Then came Terry Brooks, Shea Olmsford, Lloyd Alexander's Turan, David Eddings, Garion, Robert Jordan's Rand Althor, Tad Williams Simon, George R. R. Martin's Jon Snow, and countless others. One might say these stories are in my blood, mysterious blood that is. I have never met a blood relative, and to always feel unattached and adrift in the world is a unique thing indeed. Sometimes the anonymity is worn with pride, other times sorrow. Ever since I was a teen, I aimed to explore these themes in a fantasy series of my own. So here we go. The first trope we're going to talk about clearly is orphan farm boys with a destiny. Now, I grew up in Sevier County, Utah, which is, thank you, Sevier County fans, nobody ever knows where that is. It's in the middle of the desert. You just, nobody drives through there to get to Las Vegas. You, it's like a dead end. Um, I always felt like, as if someone who was adopted that I, with no heritage, that I was an orphan, Sevier County farm boy with a huge destiny. So these books meant a lot to me. Now, I came up with the idea for this panel when I was sitting at a book signing with Mr. Brian McClellan. Oh, no. And yeah, I'm going to pick on you. Do you remember oh, no. this? Do you remember this? Um, I, I know what I say about Orphan Farm Boys, so I'm just going to, I'll just let you talk here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I was sitting at a book signing with Brian McClellan and some of his fans said, hey, what tropes do you not like? And he's like, I hate the Orphan Farm Boy with the Destiny trope. And I was like, He's kind of picking on me a little bit personally, right? And, uh, and I said, "Well, hey, Brian, what if it was like not an orphan farm boy? What if it was like an like what if he was from a fishing village?" And then what did you say? I don't, I don't remember. I probably said this equally. It's the same thing. Equally, equally, you know, equally nonsense. Equally trite. Yeah. <laughs> Brian shed a single tear. <laughs> so, so, so I'm gonna give it up to the panel now to uh, go ahead and discuss my own heritage. As an <laughs> and let, and let's tear this one apart and let's see if it's maybe overused. What do you think, Larry? Or... Uh, I actually want. I, 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 I like to take tropes and I like to kind of twist them. So what I did with my orphan farm boy version was. I uh, instead of having him grow up as an orphan farm boy, I had an, I, I flipped it and went from uh, scum to making the guy basically a total jerk badass <laughs> and kind of went the opposite direction, you know, for kicks. 
But uh, I'm going to say the Orphan Farm, that giant list of stuff you had there, um, obviously those guys have sold a few books. It's, this trope has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I think often, even if you have kids um, who know who their parents are, they like to pretend they're not their real parents. <laughs> not I couldn't do that because I look exactly like my dad. So. Well, I, as a kid, yeah. I remember this story about this one kid who was born in a stable. <laughs> you mean the guy you're cosplaying? Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I don't have the abs for it. <laughs> but we know his parentage, right? <laughs> well, um, not everyone he met did. Hey, hey, when I was a kid, as an adopted kid growing up, and I don't know if there's other adopted people in here, but we kind of see the world a little differently. And uh, I used to tell all the kids in the playground in elementary school that my real mother was Stevie Nicks, and she went off. She gave me up for adoption to go be a rock star. I don't know if anybody ever believed that, but it didn't matter because they couldn't disprove it, really. Wait, you, you could have picked anyone and you went for Stevie Nicks? I, as a little boy, I thought I looked like her. <laughs> James Gandolfini was my real dad. <laughs> Zardu Hasselfrau. <laughs> so I, I want to clarify a little bit on, on my own thoughts on the whole farm boy thing. So, you know, I grew up reading epic fantasy. You know, I loved it. And it, to me, I think that my hate of the whole, uh, you know, farm boy trope actually comes from me as a writer rather than a reader. Um, because, you know, I Larry said something that I think is very true, and it's that an orphan is great because anybody <coughs> can kind of slide themselves into his head. You know, it's it's a great character that uh, that people can can go, oh yeah. You know, even when you're a kid, and you know, when your brothers or sisters are picking on you, you you go, oh, I wish I was an orphan. I wish I was, you know, this person with a magical destiny. It's it's a great place to like to go for, especially for young people. Uh, to be able to slide yourself in there. Um, and so, but as a writer, to me, it feels personally repetitive. It feels maybe a little lazy, uh, and I don't want that to like, you know, I'm not like saying that, you know, to my other writer friends here on the panel saying, if you use an orphan, you're lazy. Uh, it, it, it means that way to me personally. Um, and that it feels like it's kind of a, a cheap way to create a character that's relatable, you know, rather than trying to dig a little more. Um, and that's, you know, that's just kind of how, you know, my brain works on it. Um, and probably why I dislike the idea so much. I'll read it, and if it's done well, if any of these tropes that are done well, uh, can be awesome. But, you know, you know I, I can go for it, or, you know, I, but I'd rather personally, you know, try to do something different. Writing for kids, I can't, it, to some degree, I can't really get around it. Like, if you look at middle grade and YA fiction, you do not want to be a parent in one of those books because the mortality rate is really, <laughs> really high. Uh, because you've got to be able to get these kids out on their own, right, to have an adventure. And what responsible parent would let their 12-year-old go off and save the world? Um, so you kill them. It's a very easy solution. <laughs> No, but it's more than that too. I mean, it's. I mean, that's why. That's why every Disney character is an orphan. It, it, it's because it's an instant in for anybody who's reading, especially for a younger reader. Yeah. Because, you know, they can imagine. Oh, what if I had lost my, the people who take care of me? And that that it creates an instant an instant sense of sympathy for for uh, just on some level for for whichever character is in question. Yeah. <laughs> I just let my twelve year old grow. <laughs> <laughs> And so we uh, we discussed that one. Let's go to one that I kind of dislike. Um, not really dislike, because I think there's a lot of writers that do it well, like Brandon Sanderson does Magnificent Magic Systems. Jim Butcher did a, a Magnificent Magic System in his fantasy series. Um, however, this is a story that I'm going to relate. It's pretty brief. It's Back in the late 90s, I, I was pretty good friends with David Farland, who wrote the Rune Lords. I'm still pretty good friends with him, by the way. The relationship didn't end. But um, back then he was he was writing his first Rune Lords book, and he and he told me how he p kind of pitched it to his publisher, and, and the publisher, uh, uh, the paraphrasing, the publisher was like, "Oh, we don't care about the characters, we don't care about the story. What's the magic system?" And I was like, "Well, that's odd." But I guess back then it was 
the new magic system, the new magic system. That's what was selling the books, whether it was the Rune Lords or whatever. So I was like, um, well, I've, I've had kind of enough magic systems in my life. Uh, so let's debate magic systems. Have they become a trope in them of themselves? Or are they still viable? Uh, I mean, we've got Harry Potter, we've got, well, every fantasy book has it, right? Just uh, probably more magic systems than orphan farm boys. <laughs> I like magic systems so I can do fancier action scenes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can ramp up the special effects budget. <laughs> uh, okay, so on that one, that's actually, uh, I, that's where I thought a lot, because I actually have a book called Hard Magic, specifically because there's that old thing about, Woo, yeah. there's either hard magic or soft magic systems, you know? So I named the book that, plus, you know, it sounded kind of vaguely detective y. And, um, <laughs> but in this one, what I did, and, and I'll go ahead and spoil it for those of you who haven't read it, so I want to do something really different. So I made it science fiction, and actually, what magic was, was this giant multi dimensional space jellyfish creature. That, they, that you couldn't see, but existed parallel to our dimension, and it would find people when they were kids, and they would connect to them, and uh, they would use that power to alter one area of physics, which conveniently for me manifested like superheroes. And, uh, and then uh, as they got older, when they, 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 they the power would grow, then they died, it would go back to the creature, and that's how it fed. And that's why Matt, there was more and more magical people over time, and, it, and the space jellyfish just kept getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, and so the space jellyfish. Yeah. Stop them. I'm so sophisticated. I get paid for this. <laughs> so, so it was basically the proverbial, like, kind of the flying purple spaghetti monster. It was, it was a, it was a, it was a basically yeah. as a symbiotic parasite it was magic. And so I was just wondering, so, and I, another one I can't, and the, my other standard is I can't say what the magic system actually is, though Jim figured it out uh, when you read it. He he texted me. He's like, I, I bet the magic system is this. And it's actually a science fiction thing. And I was like, yeah, but of course Jim figured it out because he, he's pretty good at this. But <laughs> he runs wizard detectives. <laughs> no, I like magic systems. I think I think that's part of the fun is coming up with some new, unique way to do stuff. You know, and come up with a fun way to do it. See, I magic systems now freak me out to write them because I read this interview with Ursula K. Le Guin, and she was talking about how like you have to think about what your magic system is saying about the world. And she talked about how like in the first three books of the Ursi, you know, saga, they she realized years later she looked back at that and she realized there were no female users of magic anywhere in those books. She was like, I didn't like what that said about the world. And that's the whole reason she went back and wrote Tehanu and kind of picked that back up again. And ever since then I've been like like, holy shit, I have to figure out what my magic system is saying about the world? Like, this is a <laughs> philosophical... Uh, yeah, so they kind of freaked me out. Like, I've stayed away from them, actually, ever since then. That is way deeper than I have ever gotten. <laughs> I know! I, thought they, I used to think they were just for fun. And, uh, you, you, don't, you don't need to get that... You don't need to get that deep to cash the check. It's all right. <laughs> No, I, I, I do agree, like, the thing is, is magic systems, I think, do sell books. Um, you know, like, like that's, like, part of my elevator pitch. When I'm standing there and people will come up to me and say, well, what are your books about? And it's like, oh, guys who snort gunpowder and use it to do magic. Um, and, like, that's easy and interesting to people. And, like, either they relate or they say, that's weird, and keep walking. <laughs> you know, so it's quick, it's quick and easy. Um, and, uh, and so that, that is kind of nice in that way. But yeah, like everybody else said, it's fun to do magic systems. It's fun to come up with them. It's come fun to write them. Uh, they help with the action scenes. They, you know, lots of cool stuff about them. All right, you guys are giving me permission. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't express, man. And anything you write, someone's gonna get mad at you for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In Ursula's case, Ursula got mad at her for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a somewhat of a magic system in my book. Uh, Last year I was put on a magic system panel here at Salt Lake Comic Con and I have to admit that in book one there really is no magic. It's, it's, it, the characters believe in magic, they just never see it, but they are religiously <coughs> devoted to its existence. And so over the course of the series it's going to slowly start to reveal itself. And uh, well, I'll just leave that as a mystery as, as part of the series. But um, yeah, at the moment I, I have not done a magic system and I need to think of one quick because I've set it up that there's going to be one. <laughs> well, good. It's a good book. I'm waiting for the sequel. You need to. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, well, thanks for reading it. A recommendation from Larry Correa oh, is always awesome. So let's, uh, if, we, if we beat the magic systems to death, let's go on to some of these. Uh, is there anything that you guys want to talk about in particular? Tropes that just irritate you or you think we need more of? Go ahead, Jim Butcher. <laughs> It, it, the, the tropes that irritate me are, are, are all of them. Because I, I feel like a lot of this discussion is because, okay, essentially what we're doing, what we do up here is we build stories. And we build stories out of, it, we build stories like you build the engine of a car. You've got to use various parts. And so what I hear when you say, I hate the, the orphan farm boy trope is, I hate the number four gear. And it's like, dude, don't get so personal and emotional about it. Sometimes you need a number four gear. And when it's appropriate to use that gear, that's when you use it. Uh, uh, and the other tropes are the same way. And the tropes that don't work are when people just glue gears onto it, uh, uh, and, and that's when that's when people oh that well that, that that trope sucks. Well, yeah, the trope does suck because it's just been glued onto the side uh, so that it can be a steampunk hat, you know, like that. <laughs> <laughs> but if the trope is doing its job, if it's in the, if it's in the right spot and do and, and functioning as a part of the machine and doing what it's supposed to do and has a purpose and you're aware of that purpose as the creator and putting it together, then then it's then it's good. And that's when. That's when it's not a trope. That's when it's an archetype, like that. <laughs> yeah, I do so, think that oftentimes readers can tell when you're lazy, you know, when you don't know exactly what you're doing, or when you're, you know, obviously cutting corners. Um, and they may not know it from a technical perspective, but they can sense it, and they'll see it in the writing. Yeah, they can tell if you're writing Gandalf or Obi Wan or any of the other mental figures we've all seen. Like, but if you're doing something unexpected with it, and, and doing something that turns it on its head, that's when I think readers get excited. My first one that I, I was, I was just tropetastic, because I, I mean, I love tropes, and so I, was, <laughs> I, I used them in, but one of the ones I used a lot was the chosen one thing. In the Monster Hunter series, that's a big deal, and I had a lot of fun with that, and, uh, and I enjoyed it a lot, but it also made me think about it in a less lazy way um, for a different series, and so I thought, okay, so you got this trope where you got the guy who defeats the evil big bad, right? And then there's always a prophecy that in a thousand years or five hundred years, whatever, only a descendant of the chosen one can be the chosen one to defeat the ultimate big bad again. And, and then when you fast forward to where the series actually takes place, there's always one chosen one, and he has to survive to fight the big bad. Okay, think about human nature, though. Um, <laughs> if you're the chosen one, and you know there's a prophecy in a thousand years, your, your descendants can only, you know, your only your descendant can beat the devil, basically. Are you gonna have one kid? Is your kid going to have one kid? No. <laughs> See what you didn't know about Genghis Khan. <laughs> exactly. It was Genghis Khan, I didn't think of that. And so I was like, oh, realistically, the guy would have 57 wives, and each of his 200-something kids would have 100 wives and concubines. And, and so what I did is I actually made it this giant bloated chosen one class. That within a few generations, there's just douchebags to everybody because I'm chosen. <laughs> and I just kind of went through life like the house of saw and tossing money. And, I like your daughter, I'm going to take her. And you know, <laughs> and that was the plot is the chosen ones were just douchebags. <laughs> so you, know, you, have, you can have fun with some of these tropes you've been through. Yeah, I mentioned Gandalf and Obi-Wan because one of my sort of, I don't like the, the mentor figure that walks on and they do exactly what you expect them to do. That just, that just bores me. Like, I would love for like a kindly old wizard to walk into a book or movie and not know what the hell is going on. Like, <laughs> that would be awesome. Then I wouldn't be irritated. Well, the first law series was Joe Abercrombie. He turned the whole, yeah. uh, you know, kindly old wizard thing you know, kind of on its head, and it's you know fun to see how that you know plays out. That's because everybody in the Joe Ever Call Me novel is a horrible person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're all just mean. Do you think uh, do you think it's becoming a trope though now to just kind of come up with the the noble Gandalf like figure and then kill him off in chapter five <laughs> um, because George R. R. Martin got away with it? Um, it's 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 not a trope as much as it is a, a functional necessity for story because if Gandalf is always there to handle a problem, how is your hero going to handle the problem? Yeah. You know, I mean, if, if if Superman's always there, what's Batman really got to do? You know, you've got that's why you've got to have five million ways to take Superman out of the way in order to have a good story if you're doing Justice League because otherwise <laughs> Superman handles it. You know, what fun is that? Yeah, because like Lord of the Rings is a party of like some level one adventurers and some level five adventurers and then a level <laughs> twenty wizard. You know? <laughs> so they had to have the Balrog fall off the cliff with them. Otherwise, what's the point? He's just gonna like bang the staff and boom, you win. 
Exactly. I, 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 I still think that I'm the chosen one myself. <laughs> I've seen no that. evidence to dispute that. The, there is none. There is none. I mean, you know, we can, we can ask Stevie Nicks, but uh, <laughs> she was probably doing a lot of drugs back then and maybe not remember. Well, all of us are good. We're just going to go on a quest after this panel because I just bought a badass hat, so we're ready to roll. We're going to cry into this destiny, whatever it is. Oh, God, we're going to die. <laughs> I'm the tank. <laughs> I have a magic talisman I need to find, guys. Let's go. And the magic talismans, what about those? The, the, the one ring into the volcano. I was thinking, there's a, across from Bard's Tower, where a lot of us are signing our books. There's a, a rock thing that kids are climbing. The Maverick, the Maverick climbing. The Maverick climbing thing. And I'm like, you know, if they really wanted to sell this, I mean, they've got people doing it all day. I was like, if they really wanted to sell this, they should have, they should have painted it black and have lava flowing from it, given everybody a little one ring to throw on the top of it, and uh, have it like explode, you know, and have like a, have like a little golem chase them up it and things like that. That's how I would have done it, right? That would be awesome. The best was yesterday. I got to climb. I'm right sitting across from that thing. Uh, I got to watch uh, a girl in, in a costume. It was like a, it was like a really tight leather costume. It was like high heels this long in a corset. Climb it while a guy in a Spider-Man costume fell off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys are lucky. I signed at the Shadow Mountain because then all I have across from me is that carpool, like car karaoke thing. The karaoke. <laughs> yes. Not everyone who gets in there can. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone that gets in there can sing Let It Go. <laughs> they try. They just oh, some guy tried Aha uh -huh, uh, Take On Me. Oh, that song. Could not hit the high note. It's like, it was kind of excruciating. Oh, did you see Stevie Nicks? Because I'm looking for my mother. <laughs> So yeah, let's, uh, well, we talked about quests and fellow, we, they were all gonna take me on a quest to find my destiny. Let's talk about quests and uh, fellowships and adventuring through dungeons and finding, uh, do you guys, I mean, I loved the Dragonlance novels when I was a kid. That was all about, that was what those were all about. The right? first I ever fanboyed was when I met Tracy Hickman for the first time. I, I did, I scared the crap out of Tracy. I'm a big guy, <laughs> shaking his hand so vigorously that he's like bouncing up and down and I had just, my first book had just come out and I literally just shoved it at him and hit him in the chest with it. And I go, Mr. Hickman, I wrote a book! You can have it! <laughs> <laughs> We're friends now, but I think I, the first time I met Tracy, I scared the crap out of him. I'm only a writer because Margaret Weiss came to, came to talk at, uh, in high school uh, and gave a talk in the, in the high school library. And I was, I, I was, I was cutting class because I was a cool senior, but I was a nerd, so I was cutting class to go to the library. And read it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, I, but, but yeah, I just happened to be there when she walked in, and I got the selection from Margaret. And I'm like, hmm, writing, that might be cool. Wow, I'm a, I mean, for me, it was Ursula K. Le Guin. Actually, it was a Wizard University. I read that, and I was like, that's what I want to do. And like, my career already peaked on my second book when I got a blurb from her on my novel I saw, I was like, what? Well, I don't know where you go from there. Like, <laughs> I, the person who inspired me to write blurred my book. I'm, I'm done. Uh, I, was at a, I was at a convention uh, in Tampa uh, not that long ago, and I'm standing next to Michael Stagpole. Yep. And I'm like yeah, sitting there going like, oh man, he wrote so many books that I read and loved as a kid. This is so weird. And, uh, and it's like a, yeah, you like have that weird fanboy moment where you're like, I'm a professional, damn it, but I also love this stuff. <laughs> You're like, I have no dignity left after spending three days next to him. Like, oh, by the way, I love this. He's a cool dude. Yeah, nice guy. Yeah, I, my first ever fantasy novel I ever, well, the first novel I really ever read was when I was about 12 years old. I picked up The Sword of Shannara. And uh, they went on a quest in that, and it just filled my head with so much magic and enchantment. And I. I mean, that was the day I decided one day I'm going to write a book, and you know, like, 30 years later, I did. And all of these, all of these books use tropes. Like, all of these yeah. authors use tropes. They use them well. Like, they're the best. Yeah, it's not like they were the they were the first ones to pull them out of the hat yeah. either. They, they all of these spit around for thousands of years. Yeah. Well, Beowulf and Gilgamesh have tropes that we yeah. still use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, well, heck, the chosen. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because like the there's. there's there's a lot of those books that I I won't read again as an adult because I'm like I don't I don't want to ruin the magic of the memory 
because there's some of them that just don't hold up. But like a lot of the fantasy that came out of like the 80s and stuff, it feels like kind of horrible to us today, but they were the first people to do with that particular trope in that way. Yeah. And then, you know, then, you know, 20 people did it after them and did it the same way, and that's why it feels kind of dead and dated to us. Well, yeah. some stuff comes and goes too, because there's, you'll see, there'll be like a long run where a bunch of people do kind of similar things, and then someone will do something new, but not, I mean, sometimes the thing they're doing that's new is just what they were doing. 10 years ago before whatever the latest trend was. I mean, this stuff, the way I always try to say it is, if you guys think you've come up with something truly original, you probably haven't and just haven't read enough. Because there's been millions of creative people telling stories for thousands of years. And so pretty much everything's just gonna happen. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I, I grew up on David Eddings and uh, <laughs> Lloyd Alexander and the Dragonlance and the Terry Brooks and, and uh, all of these things that were kind of, they were fantasy and they were they were kind of all PG rated. and. Uh, and then I picked up these books called Thieves World. I don't know if any of you remember those. <laughs> and then they were, for a, a teenager, they were pretty dark, especially a teenage boy in southern Utah, you know, in a conservative community. And I'm reading about Thieves World. And, the and son then, of Stevie Nicks. This, uh, this, <laughs> yes. and, well, I, I never really bothered to try to figure out who, who, who I never had any fantasies of who my father was. I, I, I just assumed it was Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> Which another thing, another thing that happened when I, I'm old enough that I saw Star Wars for the when it originally came out. I was just a little little boy in 1977. And I remember that when Obi-Wan Kenobi was telling uh, Luke that, uh, no, Darth Vader hunted and killed your father. In my head, I was like, no, Darth Vader is his father. Because that's the way my brain worked. And I told all the kids in the playground, Darth Vader is Luke's father, Darth. And they're like, no, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy. It was like about three years before I finally was vindicated. <laughs> but I, I could spot stuff like that. Which, you know, maybe that's part of the trope that you kind of, <coughs> Star Wars kind of created a, uh, a trope about that. Um, what, one of the tropes here is plucky princesses. There's always plucky, but I don't know if we're the group though. <laughs> Dudes. I mean, I'm, no, I'm an orphan farm boy, but I'm no plucky princess that I'm aware of. And or any of you other guys. I think the plucky princess is charming in a way that is different than like a lot of like, you know, than like the, the farm boy is. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it kind of, I mean, Disney kind of rules the world now, and you know they kind of came from Plucky Princess. That's their brand, uh, and Plucky so Princess is like a sixty billion dollar industry. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like I feel like if I say anything bad about it, I'm going to be immediately assassinated. <laughs> yeah, so, we should maybe not. Maybe we should maybe just cut that one off. Well, I kind of, I kind of wish we had like you know a, 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 a woman fantasy writer or two on the panel. To, um, because I do think like there is like a different like I've heard Holly Black talk about tropes and stuff, and she said things that has never occurred to me, and um, she just thought about things in a whole new way. But I didn't put I, I came up with the panel. I didn't decide who was on it though. I know. I'm not blaming you. Yeah. We did. A, so we please just, don't blame me. I just did an anthology, uh, a Monster Hunter anthology, a bunch of different authors in it. Jim's in. And one of the one of the authors I invited was Jessica Day George. And Jessica Day George, her career, uh, uh, she's a New York Times bestseller, her career uh, is based on like plucky princess adventure. Oh yeah, and she, she does such an awesome job. Jessica owns that market, but uh, so I'm, I'm not, I and mean, I know she's a fan, all right, of the Monster Hunter, so I invite her to write in this universe, and I have no idea what she's gonna write, but I know that Jessica's like plucky princess is like her, she's the master of this genre, right? So I invite Jessica, and I'm like, what do you want to write? And she's like, trailer park elves versus gnomes, turf war, and I'm like, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is just because you're, you, you know, you, you, that's like one of your things that you're good at. I mean, uh, we're, as writers, we're way broader. I mean, there's all sorts of crap that we'd like to get into. I, I've, I've done a little, I actually, even though I have like Larry Korea, you know, my reputation, I, I've written some plucky princesses just for kicks. And it's kind of fun. And I don't know, it, that's, that's, a, that's a fun trip. Yeah, my, the second book, that Liquid Wind Blurb, that I wrote has a Viking princess in it. She's, she's not plucky. She's Kind of depressed, actually, but um. <laughs> it's like the opposite of yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, there's two plucky princesses in uh, my book, and uh, you know they've got their different personalities. You just write uh, as, a, as a male writer, you just write the females as, as best you can, and hope that it works. Um, but we, Larry mentioned something about elves and stuff, so let's uh, let's talk about you know the Dungeons and Dragons class of elves, dwarves, gnomes. Fighters, paladins, thieves, rogues, assassins, and cloaks. Well, 
I, okay, so I, I, one of the things I did in one series is I took all of those and I flipped them. And so my elves lived in the Enchanted Forest trailer park. My orcs are all heavy metal. Uh, you know, minotaurs are from Texas, so they're bull men, and you call them a minotaur, they get pissed off, because like, do I look Greek to you, asshole? <laughs> so, so in that series, I took all the traditional D&D &D stuff and I flipped it. You know, and, and, and there's a lot of fun to still be had with that, but that's not to say that doing it traditional and, and playing it straight, there's anything wrong with it. But if you try to sell right now in like New York Publishing and you have a new book and you try to sell traditional dwarves and traditional elves, you probably get shot down because uh, they're saying, well, that's tired and cliche. But then Dragonlance, come, or not Dragonlance, uh, Dragon Age, the video game comes along and plays that straight and makes 10 bazillion dollars. You know, so it's kind of the chance. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I do think you can get away with it a little easier in other uh, medias um, because it's, I don't, because it like started it in books, right? You know, and so so it feels you know kind of more tired to us, you know, as readers than it does maybe to viewers. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe. Man, when I started the Dresden Files, I got a bunch of D and D character sheets and wrote up the characters. <laughs> and, you know, so you know, Harry's the wizard with the like the, the sixteen intelligence and the eighteen constitution. <laughs> it's like the guy who just really, really wanted to play a wizard, and the D&D is looking at him like, dude, are you, are, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm totally sure. 16 Intelligence, that's awesome. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, wish you, I wish you'd been there on this other panel I was on, where this guy was like, uh, he was a, it was an audience question, I think he was seeking some validation, and he was like, do you guys ever use RPGs to like help you develop your stories? And oh. no one on the panel did, and he kind of left dejected, and I... I want him to know yeah, well, that. Yeah. yeah, well, the whole point of the RPG is that, is that here uh, you're going to play one of these. You're going to play one of these archetypes, and so you, so you can be able to focus on who your character is. And and and, and here here's here's uh, here's these physical descriptors of his abilities and sort of what he's able to do as a human being. So you, to help you you know to understand what what you can try to do within this role playing game and be good at. You know, I mean that's that, that's what they're all there for. Uh, it, 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 again, it's a question of, of having the tools and using them properly, or yeah. or or just kind of throwing them around the room. My game group's five novelists. Anytime anybody in there says anything really clever, we all stare at each other to see who's going to steal it first. <laughs> Have you noticed anything you've said show up in the, someone else's Yes. Okay. In fact, I've straight up stole other guys' characters and put them into books. I wrote, okay, I wanted, okay, uh, there's a, there's a, you know that 100 best short stories of the year thing they have with the blind judging? Um, well, I was a finalist one year, which was funny because the judges all hate me, and then they saw they voted for a Larry Korea story, and they're like, oh, crap. But, but the whole story was straight up stolen from an RPG. I straight up stole one of the guy's stories. And the only reason I did it is because I, I brought up the story, and it came up on the deadline. There's Kaiju Rising, and I forgot about it, and we came up to the deadline. I had like 24 hours to turn in a 5,000-word story. But we just played this RPG, and I was the GM. So I called up my buddy. He's like, dude, Tony, I'm going to steal your, your story and write it up. And he's like, go for it, man. So I wrote it up and turned it in and, and sold it. <laughs> yeah, RPGs are awesome for this stuff. Yeah, I almost always run RPGs in a world that I'm getting set to build and I'm getting ready to work on before I actually start writing it. Because PCs are agents of chaos, and no matter how much you plan, they will not go that way. They will go that way. <laughs> which, which forces you, which forces you to kind of be building the world like two feet ahead of their toes, uh, so that they don't fall off into the void. And I mean, I find that to be a creative challenge, and it really gives me a lot of good material that way. Do I will drive to Colorado to play Cinder Spire with you? <laughs> that was a good campaign. We ran it in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, oh, Jim, Jim, Jim texted me the other night because he's reading Monster Hunter Siege, and I, I have this one recurring role-playing game character I do for throwaway funny campaigns named Krasnov, where I do really bad Russian accent. I'm oh my god, you put him in a book? <laughs> Dude, you use Krasnov in a book? It's like, well, yeah. Because <laughs> he's so ridiculous, but I did. I stuck him in a book. Yeah. Oh. Well, it actually, what, now that I think about it more, like, um, because you are, you're taking on a trope, but then you're kind of mixing the trope with real people, like when you're sitting around a table, and so you will find that that trope will behave in ways that are not predictable. And that will, that would be really, um, if we're distracted by this baby up here, it's, because it's an adorable, like, Time Lord baby that was <laughs> sucking on a sonic screwdriver earlier. Yes. No, I know that baby. That's an Andrew Whedon baby. That's, a, that's yeah. A that, that's varsity level period up there. <laughs> I mean, you don't have a chance, kid. I'm sorry, but your cosplay's awesome. 
and now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> okay. that, that baby, that baby's uncle's a writer too, and, and, and this is a very nerdy family. That baby has a nerd pedigree. <laughs> Do you guys live on a farm? Is that a the little... <laughs> <laughs> Just say drive carefully. So we established the chosen one, the party has to protect. Yeah. <laughs> so Brian finds his destiny. <laughs> Well, so um, I, we really, we've, we've went through pretty much everything on my list here. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. If any of you gonna want to line up and ask, throw a question at us, go ahead. We'll maybe get five or six people in the line. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that tropes aren't necessarily bad because they're overused, but because sometimes they make stories predictable. So how do you use tropes but not be predictable? Um, I, I just basically like when I'm consciously using a trope or an archetype, like I want them to walk on the page and I want them to feel familiar to the reader, but then I don't really hold myself to any rules as to how I use them. Like I don't necessarily need them to behave like that trope. Like once the, once the reader has recognized it, that's when the fun can happen because you can do stuff that they're not anticipating. Yeah, I think uh, I think that as an author, a lot of times your your challenge is is walking a balance like that uh, because you know when you present something, especially very obviously like a trope, uh, you are making a promise to the reader, um, and so they're they're expecting something, and sometimes they're hoping that maybe you don't exactly do that, um, and so you you're kind of you have to deliver. Uh, what you promise the reader, or give them a good reason why you're not delivering it, and that that may just be the twist or the whatever you're doing to make it not uh, boring, you know, or not tropish. Yeah, to a degree, stories need to be predictable because if the story, because th that's what makes it a creation and not just a series of random happenings. Um, uh, 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 not you don't want it to be predictable so that everybody knows exactly what's going on because that makes it boring, that's too much. But a really good story, by the time you get to the end of it and you look back at it, if you look back at it and go, oh man, there's no other way that story could have played out, that was inevitable, uh, uh, then that's the, that's the good creation. But, but the, 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 the flip side of that is, if it's inevitable, it's also predictable. Uh, uh, so you, you've, got to, you've got to find a way to walk that balance and give the reader that emotional satisfaction without necessarily handing them something they've seen a, a, gaj a gajillion times while still giving them something familiar to them. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult balancing act, and the only way to do it is to practice and to be able to, uh, uh, to, be able to, to get reactions from your audience. Next um, question. So my question kind of builds off of that. I hope that it's uh, not just a reiteration of that same idea, but um, I feel like thanks to tvtropes.com and all kinds of internet conversations and panels like this, everybody knows tropes by name. Right, so we're able to predict what's going to happen, and so authors just subvert tropes, and subverting tropes has become its own trope. So you can't have a mentor character, they'll be like, oh, well, he's gonna die in a couple pages, or he's gonna be the antagonist, like, there's gonna be one or the other. Um, how do you approach subverting tropes without making that in and of itself too tropish or obvious? Whoa, that's bad. <laughs> that, was, that was like a good question there, actually. <laughs> For me, I think it would kind of go back to what I was talking about a minute ago with the RPGs. Like, when I, I mean, my background uh, is in school psychology, and um, like, my characters, I always want them to feel like real people. And so, I think that for me is is the key. Like, if it feel if they feel like a real person and they don't feel like they are a trope serving a function, then I think that might be you know a way to approach it. That's what I try and do. Yeah, in my book, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it is about an orphan farm boy with a destiny, but that's only just like a, a small part of the story, kind of like Jon Snow is a small part. Well, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little smaller than the Jon Snow thing. But anyway, uh, but yeah, I worry about exactly what you said. If I created this character that's a trope, and now if I kind of start twisting things up and making him less of a trope and less of a trope, is that actually being tropish in itself? So yeah, I don't. I hope I can pull it off. That's all I can say. I don't worry about it that much. I just go. Yeah, question doesn't yeah. make sense to me. 
Uh, I mean, because it's uh, they're all just parts that you put together into the story, and 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 the, the parts that serve a function. I mean, I, I don't try and, and and go out and say, well, how can I build this engine with lots and lots of extra gears, or with no gears, with upside down gears, or backwards gears? And, and it can be done, but if you if you really get into that, you're going to drive yourself insane, and it's hard to build a good engine. Uh, uh, so focus on getting the engine that runs, and then worry about the other stuff later. And if you get to the end and it sucks, just take that part out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, you can, if you have interesting characters and compelling plot, you can get away with pretty much anything. <laughs> okay, so TV tropes totally stole my my question. So I'm going to go along with the pattern theme. Do you guys have any life hacks as you're writing? I know Jim's talked in the past about how if he plays a certain video game before he starts writing, he gets more words done, and if he wins, he gets even more words done. Do you guys have any patterns like that you've noticed? Coke Zero and Lay's Potato Chips. Respect. <laughs> <laughs> I use music a lot. Like, I, for every book, I kind of create a playlist with, and it's usually wordless. Like, I don't, I don't like lyrics, um, so a lot of film scores and other stuff like that, but I, I try and find pieces that are evoking the themes and the moods and what I'm going for in the book, and then I listen to that. Yeah. I, I, I listened to a lot of Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rock and roll joke. <laughs> I'm up. So have you guys ever had, no, forgive me, I, I stutter a lot and I'm not very good at speaking. Uh, have you guys ever had like a character that was just a little too tropey? So you've got like side character A, side character B, side character C, and as you're going through it and you realize uh, how weak of a character it is. Have you guys ever had to do like a kind of rewrites? Yeah. Uh, uh, for me, Susan Rodriguez in the Dresden Files. Um, because I started, I wrote the first two books and, and Susan was doing the girlfriend of the superhero thing and I realized, and she was a reporter and I realized, oh my God, it's Lois Lane. <laughs> and so I said, okay, well, I, I'm, I'm not gonna continue writing this, the, 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 you know, I, I can't continue doing this the way it has been, that just won't be interesting. So what can I do for, what can I do to make her cooler? Uh, uh, and, and, and you know, kind of a little bit better fit and to function better in this story. And it's like, oh yeah, okay, we'll 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 get her part vampire, and, and that'll be cool. Plus, it tortures Dresden, which makes it a double plus. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> personal thing that uh, when I with all my secondary characters, I like to look at a secondary character and say, could I write a book about this character? And if the answer is no, then I've not done my job. Mm -hmm. I need to make it more interesting. If I can write a book about that character, then I do so and get paid. <laughs> I, had a, I had a character that I wrote the whole book, turned it into my editor, and she was like, I don't, this character is just like a bland sidekick. Like, they're not doing anything in the book. Like, we either need to cut this character or give them some purpose. It was like the extra gear on the steampunk hat. Like, it was not. And so, um, I was struggling with that for a while, and there's actually somebody in my writer's group who was like, well, what if you make her a boy? And suddenly, the whole book changed, and I had to rewrite it with this whole new character that served a vital function. So yeah, that's happened to me. Oh, me too. I, I, a lot of the, there's a handful of characters that have switched genders in my book just because I thought it worked better. And I, I was also given some advice by my agent because one of my main characters, he said, was a little dull. So what I did was uh, combined him with another character that was exciting. And then I create, instead of having kind of an exciting character and kind of a dull character, now I kind of had like a one character that was uh, both kind of exciting and kind of dull. <laughs> uh, oftentimes I will realize that a character is not interacting with the plot in an interesting way. Uh, they're being swept along and not, you know, they're not active in the plot. They're not doing their own thing to try to accomplish things. And, you know, and I'll, I'll get like seven or eight scenes of their stuff and I'll be like, why do I not want to write this character? Why are they not interesting to me? And I'll, I'll go back and read through it, and I'll say, oh, oh, it's because, you know, everything is happening to them. They're not making anything happen. Um, and that oftentimes is one of the weaknesses that I need to fix in edits. Excellent answer, Brian. Um, go ahead. We've got five minutes, so let's do these last three questions real quick. Speed round. Okay. Um, as a as a writer yourselves, do you find yourselves analyzing other people's books as writers and finding those tropes that 
you use yourselves often or don't like very much, or do you just read a book as a reader and just enjoy it and go, oh, wait a minute, I think I saw that pattern. Writing ruins reading. <laughs> <laughs> it's really super hard. Yeah, you start, your brain starts editing. Yeah. It's tough. You guys do? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. Well, and, and then when you find somebody who is, their style is sufficiently different from yours, uh, uh, but similar enough that it's still, it's still comfortable and familiar, that, that you can read them and, and, and you can read them as a reader again, then that becomes a treasure. That becomes oh, one yeah. that goes on the that, that that goes right next to the bed. There's there's a few authors that are out there that I still just think are I'm in awe of how they write and so yeah I can still enjoy them because I'm like, oh my gosh, if only someday I could be, you know, like that. I do a lot of audiobooks because it's e my brain won't edit an audiobook. Oh yeah. 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 Well yeah, I've got all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Explain how you like my writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wes Masters is a sexy beast. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. All right. So, um, I think one of my favorite times about seeing a trope is when I was oblivious to trope the whole time. I remember the first time I realized um, that Larry Korea was very clever was when I realized the chosen one was a lie the entire time. Or uh, I do remember at Jim Butcher's when the right person picks up the right holy sword and, it's, and everything is right with the world. And then he destroys my life. And uh, <laughs> I, you're welcome. <laughs> almost through the book. Um, um, I kind of wish I would have read it. As long as you the next one. The good. question is: <laughs> any suggestions for trying to like? Here is the trope. Here is the obvious trope with all the fireworks. How do you get the players? How do you get the readers to ignore that trope? To so I can slide in the real one. The, the like that's uh, like a sleight of hand kind of thing. Yes. How do you how do you show off the uh, the fake trope so you can show the real trope? Like that's that's one way I've seen that really trick the, the people who know what they're doing. It's like, oh, I've seen this. I've seen this. I've seen this. <laughs> I mean, that's another balancing act. Yeah. You know, like, too. Yeah. yeah. Like, like you mentioned earlier, the whole idea of um, you're making a promise. If you just do it without setting it up properly, the reader's going to be pissed. Yeah, like it's like it's learning how to it's learning how to be very subtle about things, and, o and oftentimes it's it's literally like in a scene, you know, it's yeah, sleight of hand, you know, look at this, without being too obvious that they're supposed to look at this, because if you telegraph it too much, if you're like really piling on a trope, then people are going to be like, either they're going to get bored, just like oh I've seen this so many times, or they're going to just get suspicious, and then and that might ruin things. Um, so, you know, it's a total balancing act. It takes tons of practice. Read some mystery novels. They do that really good, because that's yeah. kind of like the stock and trade for that whole genre. Yeah, red herrings. So I have a bit of a challenge for you guys. Um, Two-sentence stories are all the rage on social media. You see them all the time on Facebook and Twitter. A what story? Two-sentence stories, or like a four-word story. You know, scare me with four words, or make me sad with two sentences. So that's my challenge for you guys. Two-sentence stories. <laughs> no pressure or anything. <laughs> I, I read 180,000 word novels for a reason. <laughs> My story is she said zero, so I think we're at zero time. Oh, we're going to all use that as an excuse to not. <laughs> you know, I was just close to saying something brilliant, too, but we're out of time. So. <laughs> <laughs>